actually a very cool experience for me. I'm new to the area. I've been here uh, since 2019. But of course, something happened between 2019 and today, right? That didn't allow me to even explore Eugene. And so this is actually, I think, probably my first time engaging with community that is outside of the university, right? Maybe some of you are actually uh, students or, or um, members of the university, but so I'm very excited to be here and I'm very, very, very grateful that you, you know, that you're here and that you, uh, for, for the invitation. So what I had planned to do, uh, and of course, let me just introduce myself. My name is Ramon Alvarado and I'm a professor, I'm an assistant professor of, of philosophy and data ethics at the University of Oregon. My, I specialize in philosophy of computation uh, and I also do data ethics. And so there's a couple of, of, of branches to my research that lead me to think a lot about artificial intelligence, right? And so uh, today I will talk to you about our understanding artificial intelligence and I'll guide you through a couple of considerations that I usually tell my students or that I usually um, like to talk to my students about. And it's this idea that, you know, despite everything that Hollywood tells us about AI, despite everything that we see in the media and that um, people repeat to themselves about what AI is capable and what it does and how it does it, there's something very important about understanding the actual artifact and understanding that a big part of artificial intelligence has to do with that artifact, right? And the artifact ends up being a lot more boring than what the um, pop media tells us. So at the end of it all, I'm going to kind of guide you through a few considerations that perhaps will make you think that AI is actually pretty boring. But hopefully, it would also make you think that AI has a completely different set of implications uh, than the ones that you thought um, were the case, right? And so the first thing uh, is that we're not going to be talking about robots too much today. We're not going to be talking about that kind of application of artificial intelligence because I want to go to the nitty gritty and the details of what these methods are that people call AI, where they are used, and then what are their ethical or epistemic implications, right? What, what do they mean for knowledge? What do they mean for science? What do they mean for policy? And what do they mean for people like us, right? Which are the ones that are affected by artificial intelligence. And so just really quickly, um, you know, the overview for today, is just let's clarify some terms. Let's talk about it. And of course, you know, it's gonna sound like a lecture in the beginning, um, because you know, it, it would be nice for us to get sort of in the, on the same page. I tried to run really quickly through all of that stuff. So hopefully, yeah, we can actually just engage with each other and talk about um, what you're worried about, what you're thinking about concerning AI, right? So first, what is AI? How does it work? What does it do? And then we'll talk about then the implications for, for philosophers, the implications for ethicists, and definitely the implications for us as citizens, for us as um, subjects of these technologies, right? And then we'll open it up to discussion. So let's start just really quickly. Um, in philosophy, there's a big history of dealing with AI, but this history was very narrow. And from the, you know, the 70s and 80s and 90s, and even in the early 2000s, it was all focused in philosophy of mind. So when people were talking about AI in philosophy, they were wondering whether a machine could be conscious. They were wondering whether there's something about the mind that can be reduced to some sort of computational system, right? And so then you get distinctions like um, the strong AI versus weak AI and things like that. And of course, you, you get discussions that are very interesting concerning like the imitation game. Uh, Turing has this idea that, you know, in 1951, that maybe if you build a special kind of machine that can compute and can mimic some sort of, you know, cognitive processes, then you can maybe program it to play a game to deceive you and make you think that it's human. And if it manages to do that, then the machine or you have no way of saying whether the machine is conscious or not and you must accept that they might be smart that they might be like us and all of those things right so that's that's basically what the, the origin of the discussion in philosophy was turing's imitation game you also have you know then you have a lot of discussions about 
variations of the imitation game and you know when is the machine supposed to be conscious blah 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 and then you have other people kind of arguing it's like no you know at the end of the day it's nothing but symbol manipulation so this is a turing machine on the left side and according to Searle, a famous philosopher from you know from the last century um he was saying like look all that computers do is manipulate symbols in such a way that you're just putting some sort of questions on one side and then imagine you're inside of this room and all the questions are in Chinese and in Mandarin right and you read you don't really read you don't really understand Chinese all you do is look at the drawings for you they're drawings right symbols and then you look at a book and the book says every time you see this symbol draw this other symbol right and so you draw the other symbol and then you put the answer on the other side and the person that's outside of the of the room is going to think wow so this is the question in chinese that i posed and this is the answer in chinese that i got so whoever is inside the machine or whoever is inside the room must understand chinese right but it's not the case so searle kind of tells you, you know you know in fact there's no it's no reason to think that anything like this is conscious, that the room is conscious, that the person inside understands anything. And so there's no reason for us to think that anything that looks like the stuff on the left, computers are conscious or understand anything, right? Anyway, that's the, the main area in which AI was discussed in philosophy, right? With these kinds of topics. Can a machine be conscious? Does it understand anything? Is it anything like us? blah 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 right now i and especially in the last in this century a lot of us have taken a different term and we kind of try to take it away at least take away the monopoly of conversations about ai from philosophy of mind and bring it elsewhere right like first of all say what is artificial intelligence what kind of artifact what kind of machine what kind of method it is and then think about it in terms of epistemology. What does it mean for knowledge when we're using these methods? What does it mean for, for, for policy when we're using these methods, right? And so you can see there's all kinds of um, interest in AI, in the history of AI, right? So the first kind of AI was called GoFi, good old fashioned AI. That's when, you know, Turing and others thought that if you just completely programmed absolutely everything that you, a computer needed, then you can mimic everything that a human does, right? It's called good old fashioned AI because they thought that, you know, it was very kind of a, how you say that, uh, brute force. You had to program absolutely everything, right? And then there was the second boom in AI. So we realized that, hey, guess what? You cannot just program everything into a computer. That would be crazy. Imagine all the commands that our brain goes through. Imagine all the information that our brain processes. Try to compute that, try to program that. It's not gonna work. So, okay, the interest in AI goes down, right? But then there was a second boom, right? Where people started saying, it's like, okay, well, what if you just start looking at the way information flows in institutions and corporations and maybe we can mimic that right let's make a computer that has a knowledge base and blah 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 okay and then of course we realize it's like well there's so much tacit knowledge that it's not even accessible to a lot of us there's no way we can make a, a, a database that is as big as even what um what a ceo has in their head or or, or what other employees have in their head so okay that dies right it goes down but recently, because of what happened in the 2000s and, and, and the mid 2010s, right, with deep learning and other statistical methods in artificial intelligence, the interest started peaking, right? And so now you see AI all over the place, right? You see it in media, you see it analyzing finances, you see it uh, in the news when it comes, um, when there are questions about bias and fairness of automated systems. And so now there's a huge interest and excitement, right? Um, and of course, concern, because through these statistical new methods applied to these computers or these computers applying these statistical methods, they reach like, a lot of power, right? So now these processes can actually achieve a lot of the things that the first pioneers were dreaming of, right? Without us programming them, particularly without us having to put so much 
data in them. They can just analyze data and extract patterns and stuff like that. So because of that, uh, there's a lot of excitement. I guess this talk is part of that excitement, right? We're all kind of worried about AI. We're all kind of interested in AI. We've all kind of heard about AI. Now, the idea is, is this, right? So what exactly is AI? So I'm just gonna open it a little bit so like I can hear you know, your, your idea. So, so if somebody was to ask you, like, what is AI? What would you say? We didn't hear, you know, maybe one or two answers would be nice. Algorithms. Yeah, okay. So one would be, it's like, hey, there are algorithms, right? So AI equals an algorithm. Um, other answers? Like bots. So bots, right? Bots that can process some sort of uh, narrative, right? Anybody else? I think of it as sort of a, a decision engine that addresses either specific questions or very general questions. Yeah, so you can you, you can have uh, a, a, a decision-making system, right? If this is the situation, if this is the pattern that you recognize, you should do this. And it's automated and it does that, right? So we're all kind of right and we're all kind of wrong about it, right? Um, but I'm very happy that at least in this room, the, what we're thinking about AI is a lot closer than what a lot of us think when we watch films, right? So it's definitely not this robot, it's definitely not this floating mind that is gonna take over the world. Uh, and so I'm really happy that we're a little bit more, more grounded because that's exactly it. it's algorithms, they're decision-making systems, they are natural language processing systems. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so they can extract patterns, but they can also manipulate the data in the, in, in, that they find in those patterns, right? And they can reprocess it and resend it again and make, maybe make decisions. So we're all right in, in that sense. And the way I like to think about what AI is and the way I like to kind of extract it from these, um, this idea that they might be robots and things like that, or that they, we're talking about anything like the mind, is to go back to uh, some of the pioneers in the 1960s, right? This is a footnote from Herbert Simon's book, The Science of the Artificial. And it's a, just a tiny little footnote, I think in page four or something like that, where he's talking about, it's like, look, there's some colleagues and friends of mine at MIT that are using this term called artificial intelligence. And yeah, it sounds, it sounds kind of interesting. And of course, everybody loves it. But us over here at Carnegie Mellon or uh, us at Rand Corporation, right? Um, we use other names for that exact same thing, right? So that exact same thing that people started calling artificial intelligence they called it something else and they call it something very boring, right? They call it either complex information processing systems or they call them, you know, um, the possibility of simulation cognitive uh, processes, right? And so when, when, when I see this footnote and I discovered this footnote, you know, a few years back, I was really, really uh, happy because finally here was evidence, historical evidence that we didn't just have to use the term AI um, and that I actually, the term AI was a little bit muddy, right? Every time you say intelligence, it makes you think of humans. Every time you say intelligence, it makes you think of reason and inference and stuff like that, right? And for a lot of us that were uh, acquainted with the machinery, the methods, the computations, you know, it didn't look like anything intelligent, right? It didn't, it looked more like just manipulation of patterns. It looked more like algorithms, right? And so what, you know, what this uh, told me is like, look, okay, so maybe, maybe this is very telling. And imagine all the, all the, um, all the travel we would have saved if, if instead of calling it AI, we called it something very boring like C, uh, CIP, right? Or SCP, we would have kind of not had to write about the minds and how machines are conscious, right? It wouldn't have elicited the same kind of, of philosophical troubles that we got into in the 1990s. And so interesting, of course, we would also have missed out on a lot of sci-fi, right? <laughs> because nobody would have written about these boring names. Um, we wouldn't have Westworld, we wouldn't have all of those things, right? And so, but at the very least, it was very telling for me. And it was very telling because, um, if the pioneers thought that you know these terms were interchangeable, then maybe we can examine these terms that are a little bit more precise, less muddy, less cloudy, less less mystical almost, right? That have nothing to do with the mind when you look at complex information systems, or at least that they don't sound like that. 
Um, and so, you know, I started kind of looking into it and a lot of people started kind of looking into this um, to be more precise about this artifact, right? And so if we look, for example, what kind of, what kind of information do they mean when they say these are complex information processing systems? Well, at the time in the 50s and 60s, of course, they, they meant just numbers, right? Numeric information. And these uh, were sometimes even binary because in the 50s, um, computers were even a lot simpler than they are today, right? And of course, they were processing. What do they mean by processing? Well, just manipulating, right? Getting this number, erasing it, putting another number over here, getting that first number and putting it over here. And then that's just that, right? Interchanging numbers. They were manipulating the numbers and, and, and all of that in, in, in stuff. And so, again, sounds a lot more boring than AI. Right, it sounds a little more boring than what whatever our brains are doing. Of course, our brains are capable of doing this, but they're capable of so much more, right? Um, what about the second definition, right? Simulation of cognitive processes. So, yes, they manipulate information, yes, this information is numeric or binary. But what do they mean when they say that these systems manipulate um or you know are mimicking cognitive processes? Well, what they meant at the time is like guess what humans do that makes them intelligent well they do math they do logic so if we can build a machine that does math and logic then we build a machine that's like humans right they had a very kind of narrow version of, of what humans did with their brains and of course some of those math and logic uh, issues were a little bit more complex and they were problem solving um and they could you could with these skills of math and logic you could play games like chess, very difficult games that took very smart people to master, right? So all of that just gives us an idea that what they had in mind was, hey, these machines that can process binary uh, and can manipulate binary information or numeric information such that they can mimic uh, doing logic or solving problems or playing chess, right? Stuff like that. But, you know, there must be something more to it, right? Because what I just described is a computer, but it's not necessarily AI. And, and a lot of us already know that AI is not a computer. Uh, AI has something to do with a computer, but there's something else, right? And the, the answers, of course, um, before, um, you know, you think it's like, oh, this is really boring. It is my, my agenda to make AI really boring, right? Um, but maybe not so much. As you might say, it's like, look, there must be something to that, right? And the idea is like, yes, of course, because there, there, there's more than what I just described, right? Because a computer by itself is not AI, an algorithm by itself is not AI, it has to be a, a specific kind of computer and a specific kind of algorithm, right? And so, but the other part of the answer is that, well, yeah, there's something more to it, um, but not very different, right? And if you talk to a practitioner of AI, you actually go into a lab where there are writing these algorithms and analyzing these texts and, and, and extracting these patterns and all that stuff, you'll see that some of them are like, yeah, you know, in reality, you only use AI when you're trying to get money from corporations to fund your startup, right? So when you're, when you're trying to get money, you call it AI. When you're hiring an engineer, you call it machine learning because you want to sound a little bit more serious, right? And of course, when you're actually the engineer doing AI, you're just doing a linear regression. Right, you're doing statistics on data. That's it, right? And so again, maybe you'll think, uh, well, there must be something to it, right? And this is what really, really is interesting for me. It is true that doing AI is basically just implementing statistics through or with an automated computational system, right? You're just basically doing lots of statistics on big sets of data that are not, you know, understandable or uh, um, analyzable by humans, right? But of course, some of us want to say, well, um, you know, what is a linear regression anyway? Well, it's that, right? It just looks like that. It, it, it's trying to look at the distances between several data points and a projected trajectory, right? And you're trying to understand the patterns of those of that data, extract the pattern that we heard earlier, right? Through a very well-known statistical method. But you call it AI when you know, you're implementing this in decision-making processes or when you're trying to get a really big startup in San Francisco, 
right? Um, other than that, you're, you're basically implementing that. And you know, some of us, uh, the romantics in us, want to say, like, no, 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 but there must be something to AI in general, right? And of course, the answer again is yes and no. There's something more. It's not just uh, linear regressions uh, when we're talking about AI. There's other kinds of statistical systems as well, right? So you can, most of AI is either class clustering methods or classification methods. Is this email spam, yes or no? Is this person worthy of a credit uh, loan or not, right? Is, does this person belong to this category or not? Uh, clustering is also just identifying who belongs or where the data points belong to each other or they be near each other. And of course, a regression, right? Now, the interesting part, of course, I'm making it look very simplistic. These are very sophisticated computational systems, but I really want you to at least have in your head when people say AI, this is what they're talking about, right? And even if you're thinking, it's like, okay, yes, Ramon, but guess what? In the last 10 years, we have deep learning, right? And we have deep um, neural networks. And those are not just doing this, they're a lot more sophisticated. And because of those, now we have, you know, what is closer to AI because we're using neurons, and at least artificial neurons, which look something like the brain. And so therefore, maybe what we're doing is very close to the brain, which is with these machines, right? And so you might think like, you know, when you get a system, you input data, and then that data is analyzed at the first layer, and then it gives you results that are really good. It's like you ask it, you ask, is this car a Volkswagen? And then at the end of the result, it tells you, yeah, look, and it's yellow as, as, as well, right? I mean, things like there's something more happening there. Um, but, you know, the interesting part about deep neural networks is that they happen to also just be lots of math and lots of, um, lots of statistics being done, sometimes even just probabilistic methods and functions. This is a, fictional uh, neural network that is just really deep, right? And it has, you know, it has more than three layers. That's what deep means. Um, and of course, it has many interconnections between the nodes and between each one of the layers. And one of the layers is connected to the other one. It looks a lot more complicated. But at the very core of it, each node is just like a little activation function where you put some inputs. You have some weights saying this input should be valued at this much. And then you have a function that says, if this input is valued this much, then open the gate and let, let that information in. If this input doesn't meet that threshold, then don't open the gate and don't let it through. That's all it is, right? So again, uh, seemingly very simple procedures, right? So even when we're looking at uh, deep neural networks, we're um, doing very simple mathematical operations. Yes, you had a- um, Some yeah. of the terms that we're talking about are very reductionist. You're correct. So but couldn't you apply the same logic to the human brain and say, you know, it's just neurons letting information in or opening and shutting off communication with each other? Yeah, correct. So, so if you have a computational model of the, of the mind, yes, right? You already kind of have this model. It's like, hey, guess what? If you look at the physiognomy of the brain, uh, it turns out that we just have uh, a lot more of this, like many, 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 many more, right? Uh, billions of, of them. And so isn't that very similar? But again, I, one of the things that, that happens with this model is that it's already kind of a, a reductionist model, right? The neurons actually don't look like that. They're a lot more complicated, right? And they're shooting all kinds of information all over the place and statistically they connect with one another. And so this is already a very simplified version. Uh, neurons, in fact, don't look, um, don't look like this, right? This is just a scientific model that we use to try to understand. And so what I would say is that, um, Yes, this is reductionist even of AI, but if you use this model, you're being even more reductionist about the brain itself. And the fact that the brain or the mind involves some of these processes doesn't imply that it is reducible to that, like you said, right? So anyway, you know, uh, what I wanted to, to say is that, well, you know, perhaps, perhaps these are very seemingly simple pr uh, procedures. Um, all you have to do is, you know, meet the thresholds, the input has to open the gate and blah, blah, blah. But at the end, of course, there's statistical processes, right? And one of the things that like, um, you might say, yes, you, you might say, like you, like you said, Javi, that, well, don't we do the same thing? And what if we apply these statistical methods to, let's say, a body like a robot, right? 
wouldn't that be more similar to us, right? And for some of us, the idea is that this is just more of the same, right? You just build the, you put statistical methods in fingers, you put statistical methods in hands, you put statistical methods in vision, you put statistical methods, and still just statistical methods, but applied to a moving machine that looks more human, right? Um, but, but I wanna go back because what's really interesting to me about AI, and especially the artificial part, the artifice, is that you know there are basically spreadsheets and analytics on, on on data that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about artificial intelligence especially in the 21st century uh, and of course you know once we open it to discussion we can we can we can approach the question of whether maybe the brain is just statistical methods like that right um but for now i want to keep that in mind that for some of us it's just more of the same and so the implications are you know why would a philosopher be afraid? Why would you be afraid of a, um, of a spreadsheet? Why would you be afraid of, a, of, an, of an equation, right? I mean, it's a lot easier to be afraid of, let's say Terminator or something like that, right? It's running after you with a machine. And, uh, but an equation, what is it gonna do to you? A mathematical model, a statistical method, right? Plus computation. And so what I'm gonna do next is just give you very quickly a tour of the worries or concerns that philosophers have about AI now that we're treating AI as if it was this data science product, right? Where it's just analytics, algorithms, and data. And so the first worry for some of us is that, you know, knowledge might be at peril, right? Where you have these automated decision makers, we have these automated analysis methods, you might be doing science wrong and you might be doing science very quickly and you might not be doing good science after all. Right? So if you think about the way science or some scientific procedures were done, let's say a hundred years ago where somebody, even if you had a mathematical model, you could follow the equation with pen and paper, right? Or you could just actually do all the process. Now we don't, right? We just kind of put the input, machine does the analysis, then you get the output. And so some of us worry, it's like, well, is that the same thing? Is that, is, is that even knowledge, right? When all you're getting is this weird black box um, that doesn't let you know exactly what's going on. And of course, a few minutes ago, I just said, oh, these are very simple methods, right? You just do regressions and you just uh, apply math and blah, blah, blah. But it turns out that when these methods are automated through computation, the computers go through so many paths and so much information and it's such a high speed that they become all intractable to a lot of us, right? And to most humans, these processes are simply intractable. And so now we're dealing with the idea that we're deploying artificial intelligence in science to analyze and extract patterns, to tell us whether this molecule is developed this way, whether to tell us whether our hypotheses are right or wrong, blah, blah, blah. And, and it's, really hard what's going on, to know what's going on inside. And so that's the first word. The first word is epistemic. Can we really use these methods to know stuff, right? Um, because, you know, it's really hard to know what's going on inside of these black boxes. And even, even when we finally kind of figure out, or even in very narrow places in which we find out um, what they're up to, what the processes were, they have nothing to do with what we expected, right? So I want to tell you just really quickly an example, and uh, it's a fictionalized example of an anecdote I've heard that I love, right? Deep neural networks are really good at analyzing images, right? And deep neural networks is a big component of what AI in medicine, for example, is, is now, um, you know, in, in radiology and places like that, right? Isn't that your expertise to a certain extent? Yeah, I, I, for those of you who don't know, I'm a physician at the VA and at the University of Washington and a radiologist. So I do medical physics and yeah. work a lot with deep forest AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, one of the things that, so they're very good at, at recognizing images, right? You, you feed it some sort of image over here and over there, it will tell you whether the image has, you know, some abnormal cancerous growth or something like that, or, or whether it looks like other images or not. So it's really good at identifying even simple images. You ask it, hey, is this a picture of a fish or not? 
right? And some of them are really accurate, like 95% accuracy. They'll tell you, yes, this is sufficient. And now the interesting part is that there's so many layers to a deep neural network that it's really hard to really know what was th that made it actually be that accurate. You don't know exactly what it took into consideration to tell you, yes, this is sufficient. Now, in some cases, we can. If we're really careful in the way we build it, and we actually have a lot of computer power and a lot of research power to go back and try to see its past. Now, so imagine you have this, right? And you manage to locate, hey, is this a picture of a fish? And it tells you, yes, actually 95% that this is a picture of fish. And then uh, the anecdote that an engineer told me is like, when we looked back to try to see how did the machine know that this was a picture of a fish, right? When we tried to trace back to see what it was identifying to tell it that this was a picture of a fish, it was something around that area, right? And so you might think if you ask a toddler or let's say if you ask a, a, a little boy or a little girl, is this a picture of a fish? What do you think they're gonna look at most of the time? The mouth. Sorry, the mouth? Yeah, the, the mouth, right? So they're gonna look at the mouth. Uh, some of them like look at the fins, right? They look at the at the shape of the fish, blah blah blah, right? Well, this neural network was actually looking at hands, human hands, because it turns out that the majority of the pictures of fish on the internet with which the neural network was trained are of fishermen holding the fish. You don't have that many of just. I mean, you have many of fish swimming, but most of them are not. Most of, and so you just learn that it, if there's a hand, there's a higher likelihood that there's, there's a fish, right? And again, what I want to say is really accurate, really good, but it completely unexpected to the kinds of things we would have been looking for when we're looking. There's another quick anecdote of a similar problem, but whether it, the, the, the question was, is this a picture of a family car or a sports car? And it was really accurate, 95%, 99% accuracy. This is a sports car, this is a family car. And when they looked back at what it was looking at, what do you think it was? So we would look at the car, the shape, maybe the color, right? Sorry? The seats of the car, right? Motion in the background. Motion in the background, because they are very, very sensitive to pixelation texture in the background. So what it was actually looking for it was to see whether it was, the background was gray scales and lines because most pictures of family cars are taken in the city or whether it had all kinds of pixelation radiation in the background because that most, most uh, uh, sports cars pictures are taken in the wild. Right, right. just the lucky guess. guess. Yeah, I but, know the answer. yeah, but you know, most of us wouldn't have looked there to know whether this is a sports car or not. And so I just wanna point out that some of these methods are very obscure and they're very different from the way we arrive at conclusions, right? And so that's why some of us, especially if you're interested in knowledge and, and, and how to do science correctly and understanding when you pick up a phenomenon, this is really troublesome, right? Um, it's, it's just a black box and we, most of the time, we have no clue how it, they arrive at our results. Okay, so let's move up, up a little bit faster. I don't know how much uh, how I'm doing with time. Yes, I should pick it up. Okay, this so is a special... Um situation so i think we're going to let this go a little long if you want to and i'd love to have oh. people have a chance to talk so we do have an open mic at seven but we can push that back i think a few minutes oh great thank you I, I really appreciate it so okay so i'm going to try to do it really a, a lot faster um and and just give you again a run of the the concerns that some of us ethicists have so the second word is that this is not just about doing bad science is that we're doing bad science on people because a lot of the data that's being analyzed by artificial intelligence, it's about your consumer habits, about your locations, about your medical uh, information, about your citizenry, right? So, so if you're a citizen of country, a lot of information is being gathered about you. Um, and so this is about people. So let me just go really quickly and tell you, you know, if you're thinking about artificial intelligence in terms of machine learning, on the left, we see what scientists, data scientists apply machine learning for. And on the right, you see what some of us worry about, right? So like we heard earlier, of course, they de deploy it for pattern recognition, pattern extraction, pattern uh, or, or manipulation of data. They use it to classify data, right? So machine learning is really good at, at classifying stuff, 
And sometimes we use them to just explore a, a, a data set. Like we don't even know what's in the data set. Can you give us some patterns? Well, what is this about? What does this item have to do with? For a lot of us on, 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 the, on the right side, we worry that this data is being analyzed not very carefully, and it's about humans, and particularly that there might be bias in the data and we don't know it, right? And now you're deploying this huge automated system that you don't know exactly what weights and what salience it's taking in consideration. And so a lot of us worry that this is opaque. We have no way of examining it or challenging its results of understanding why it arrived at these results, right? And there might be all kinds of, of, of bias there. So for example, in early search uh, algorithms in Google, you can put something like, hey, what's the most common wedding attire? And if it was in the early 2000s, you would get a picture like the one on the left. Why? Well, because the data was biased, right? So most of Google's pictures at the time came from Western uh, developed countries where most of the weddings look like this stuff on the, on the left, right? But we know that given the population of the world, given that most of the population is not in these kinds of countries, they actually are found in India and in China and in Latin America, right? The most common wedding attire looks something completely different to this one, right? And so this is something that can happen when your data set is biased. And, you know, bias can happen at many different steps of the machine learning pipeline. You can have historical bias. Hey, guess what? The world is not fair. And there are all kinds of uh, you know, inequalities and stuff like that. That can make it into your machine learning process. Guess uh, maybe your sampling is not right. Well, that can make it into your machine learning process, right? So there's all kinds of different biases at different stages of producing this artifice, this machine called AI, right? And it can enter in many different ways. Okay. So what else do we worry about? Well, I think um, some of us, like we saw in politics since you know, 2012, 2014, 2016, and then Brexit, and then a lot of stuff, we worry that these very predictive methods in artificial intelligence for to micro-target, to cluster, to classify people, can then be used, of course, for advertising, and of course, to nudge you into better behavior, but at the same time, they can be um, exacerbating discriminatory practices or even just perpetuating discriminatory practices that can be used to deceive you, to manipulate you, right? So we, uh, the picture that I have here in the background is that of Cambridge Analytica, uh, which their main claim was the following. So Cambridge Analytica analyzed uh, through AI a lot of information uh, that you had on Facebook about yourself, right? And they were able to, pinpoint your political leaning, right? So is this person gonna vote this way? Is this person gonna vote that way? But their main gimmick was that it wasn't that if you were get voting left, they weren't gonna make you vote right. If you weren't if you're voting right, they weren't gonna make you vote left. But what they did is that there was a lot of people on the fence that they didn't really know exactly where to vote. And instead of trying to convince them to vote left or vote right, they just send them ads to not vote and kind of corroborating. It's like, you know what? Your vote does not even matter, blah, blah, blah. How were they able to do this? Well, because they pinpoint who was on the fence and then they, they targeted a campaign, a micro-targeted campaign. And so some of us worry that some of these really powerful predictive methods say, of artificial intelligence can be used to manipulate and to send deceptive uh, messaging, right? So again, I'm trying to go fast so we can get to a conversation. Um, one of the main uses of artificial intelligence is risk assessment in the United States. A lot of these algorithms act are actually being used in uh, court systems, judicial systems. So some judges are just getting this software, right? They're buying software like Compass or, or other ones that help them decide whether you get higher bail, lower bail, whether you uh, should get a higher or lower sentence or whether you should get parole or not based on a risk score, right? And again, this is a data science method of analyzing several kinds of data, lots of data, and then giving you a, a, a score. And the problem here is that, you, well, you, first of all, again, like the things that we saw earlier, they might be opaque, 
These systems don't tell you exactly which data they're looking at, how they are managing and manipulating the data, what kind of patterns they're actually taking as if they were relevant or not uh, to give you these risk scores. And for us, that's very worrisome, right? Um, here, the picture that I have is of Glenn Rodriguez, who actually spent about a year and a half trying to fight his, his risk score uh, given by uh, a specific kind of software. And he couldn't get access to how the software had given him his risk score. His judge couldn't get access. His lawyer couldn't get access. Even the engineers couldn't tell him because it's secret sauce, right? Okay, so really quickly, right? So we have epistemic concerns. We have concerns about knowledge, about doing bad science, about you know uh, miscategorizing people, about not really being able to look back into how the process gains these results. And then we have normative concerns about ethics, right? That some of the outcomes are unfair, that some of these, these, these algorithms of AI have transformative effects in the way we see the world, right? So this um, slogan of, if you like this, then you'll like that. Most of our life is now guided by that principle of Amazon, right? If you like this, let me give you more of the same, right? You, whether it's Spotify, Netflix, blah, blah, blah. These are the decision makers that you're talking about, right? And of course, traceability is a problem because now we cannot point point exactly when they go wrong. We don't know exactly why they went wrong. So it's really hard to trace responsibility in this system. And I'm just going to go really fast. We can talk about some of this is just a little bit more detail on our uh, concerns of philosophers. And one of the things that I want to just pick up again, I'm giving you a very different kind of talk about AI that is not your philosophy of mind. Right? It's not about being conscious. It's not about machines um, gaining the singularity. It's not about them taking over the world. It's more about like, hey, this is what the artifact is. It's a set of automated statistics. But guess what? It may have even more power than Terminator, right? It may have even more power over your life in the next 50 years because finances are going to be regulated through AI systems because medical uh, decisions are going to be regulated through automated systems of AI and machine learning, right? And so, well, here's uh, just really um, quickly, let's talk about automation, right? So a lot of us are worried that humans will be replaced by artificial intelligence in this semi-true, not, not exactly. You have people that say, look, radiologists, for example, radiologists are a dying breed, right? They, they shouldn't even be trained anymore because guess what? There's all kinds of AI especially deep uh, neural networks that can do the job way better. And so this is Hinton, uh, Jeff Hinton. He's a well-known uh, deep learning expert. And he was saying, hey, you know what? There's a lot of better machines out there than radiology. So we should stop training them. We should replace them with AI, right? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's an attack, right? I'll, I'll, I'll retire in five years. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just meet the cutoff. And so, yeah, he says, you know, this is like the coyote. Radiologists are just haven't realized that their jobs so won't be there in five years, right? Uh, and Hinton is not alone, right? A lot of people think this and they say, look, these methods are going to work uh, even better than humans. So um, why don't we just start? And they'll be cheaper and stuff that. And so there will be no reason to train. And some people even make this argument for morality, right? They're going to say, look, morals are the liberation. You have two trade-offs. You have to do uh, analysis of data. And guess what? Guess who does it better than you? Well, a machine does it. So if morality is a cognitive process and a machine is better at cognitive processes, then maybe we should just let the machine do the morals for us, right? And this is a very, very common argument. And I just want to say, going back to the radiologists, one of my arguments against people like Hinton that say, well, cheaper, faster, better should replace it I guess what else is cheaper, faster, and better than most radiologists at doing the job? And still, we don't think that they ought to be replaced by them. We have, no? So these guys. These guys are actually cheaper, faster, and this one better. I'm offended by. Yeah. <laughs> cheaper, faster, and better, not just than humans, but even than AI, right? So you can train these guys uh, in about four weeks to be about 95% accurate. All right. Um, if they work in teams, they can reach 99% accuracy in cancer detection of x-rays, right? So they can do all of this magnificent stuff, right? They can recognize, they can even recognize a Matisse versus a Picasso when they were fighting with each other and they look so similar to most of us, 
right? Um, they can do all those kinds of stuff. And of course, for, uh, for radiologists, this is the important, right? They have this remarkable ability to distinguish benign from malignant human breast system pathology after training with differential food reinforcement. Um, so now the interesting part is that, you know, if you really buy Hinton's claim that we should be replacing humans with AI just because they're cheaper, faster, better, then, you know, you should, um, you cannot deny then, yeah, let's, let's make Pigeon a uh, colleague, right? And have him at the lab or at the clinic with us. Uh, but you're, when you're really happy about AI. So anyway, lots of stuff to talk about. Hopefully this was a little bit informative. Um, I hope we can, we can, we can have, have a nice conversation about all of this stuff. Let's open it up to questions now. Some, some questions from the crowd. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends on how what you say it, it was programmed. So it depends if it's a supervised machine learning, then you kind of program it, but you don't really program it. You just kind of give data, and every time it gets it wrong, you kind of tell it, no, it's you got it wrong, so you don't get any points, and you incentivize it, blah, 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 right? And, and then it starts looking at patterns. And um, you might say, and even Turing said this uh, in the 1950s, he says, like, you know, how, how different is that from training a baby, right? Or training a, a little boy? Correct. Um, and, and for me, the difference is not so much in what we can positively know. The difference is on how weird and how different is the ways in which we go wrong. So for example, if you have a toddler or let's say a baby that starts talking, right? And you present it with three things, a dishwasher, a cat, or a dog. And you tell it which one is the cat, which one is the dog. And you present it several times, right? The human is almost always gonna make mistakes between the cat and the dog. So they're not really good at it yet. They, they're all fluffy. They all have four legs and blah, 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 blah. But the machines, they have, would have no problem in getting it wrong when they get it wrong. Only maybe not, only 5% of the time they get it wrong. So they're really good at recognizing cats from dogs. But sometimes they misrecognize a washing machine for a dog or a cat. That's something that wouldn't happen with, with humans. And so for me, what's interesting is not so much what they can do well, because they can do things even better than us, but the ways in which they can err, what we call catastrophically, right? They, they just go completely haywire and they still have the same level of confidence. They'll tell you, this dishwasher, they'll tell you, 95% sure it's a cat. <laughs> and now imagine you wanna say, it's like, why, what, how, how, how? You try to go back and you won't find out, right? Um, with a human, to a certain extent, maybe by the time they're five, it won't be perfect, but you can ask them, why did you think this was a dog if it was a cat? And they're gonna try to justify it. It won't be perfect, but at least there's some sort of reasoning and reason giving procedure that um, you can scrutinize. Um, so that's the, the main difference for me. And, and the other thing is that you can achieve very similar things with completely different methods, right? Um, so I can get a, wooden piece of you know that looks like a face with a speaker inside and say and, and program it to say it's like every time somebody walks say hello right or i can train a human and say you know every time somebody walks into the store say hello so you can achieve the exact same thing by completely different methods and from the outside they might look similar but on the inside there's absolutely nothing even even remotely close to one another Right, so just because we can achieve similar results doesn't mean that we're achieving similar inside uh, processes. Yeah. And I think the, the inside processes may really matter. So I think that we have one and then two. I haven't been watching, but I think Will had his hand up first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to just kind of piggyback on this too, from what you say here, is I think that um, some of the distinction would certainly come for the reasons for the need to identify the fish or the, the boat or whatever it is, like for human beings. We have an intrinsic need to identify things in order to survive. Uh -huh. We will die. And the robot, or excuse me, the uh, computer system has the need um, to identify things because we want it to, because we are 
curious about what happens. And so I think that we can't separate that from the method or from the distinctions. I think like the need or the reason why we're even doing this in the first place is intrinsic to the to the distinction. Right. Well, we have the ability to do all that yeah. like, to make our decisions on information that's coming in with AI is just depend upon whatever we can enter it. And we think it's not a definite uh, the type of zero to one way to accept all this information, but it's no. still it's learning process. True. It takes more time to defend the reason. Yeah. I would see every time I see a fish, you get a in the pink or twelve, and you get a it should be a fish. It's a, so, so, so it's making a decision at that point. True, but yeah. like, like I think one of the, well, some philosophers in the 1990s sort of said, Searle, I think it was, there's some sort of intentionality that humans have. They have an intention when they do stuff, right? So, so my intention is to actually do something for a reason or something like that. Whereas the machine, it can do it, but it doesn't have the intentionality part. Now, I, I wouldn't go all the way utilitarian saying that almost all human um, crafts and arts and endeavors are, are for survival purposes. I actually think a lot of what distinguishes from any other animals that we do stuff for absolutely terrible reasons um, that are not to our best or you know, to, to our, for our best interest. So I think things like um, pursuing the color blue before we were actually able to get the pigments took a lot of people to go into cliffs and grab a little mollusk that was attached to the cliffs and then breaking the mollusk and then opening it up and then getting this blue, you know, that cost lives, right? So it wasn't for survival. And it was definitely not like we needed blue anyway, right? We just wanted it. And so we wanted it. So that's actually even more, more in, in, interesting to me that we do stuff uh, that is not just for survival, uh, whereas even a machine might just do it for utilitarian reasons. Um, Interestingly, yeah. if you read the Old Testament, I don't know many things about the Bible, but I know one of the, one of the things is if you read the Old Testament in its original language, there was no word for the color blue mm. because really the color, the name for the color blue didn't really evolve into language until we had a way of creating it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, I have a question. So there's a lot of, we sort of think of like, can AI do these things and can it complete like a Turing test or other things? <laughs> Are there ways of thinking how are we treating the AI instead? In other words, at what point does an AI have rights? Yeah. That, at one point, if I take my computer and I smash it, mm -hmm. have I done an evil towards the computer? Yeah, that, that's a big question in AI ethics, uh, and especially the, the, the kind of AI ethics that took the other path towards cognition and towards um, consciousness and towards the possibility of cognition and consciousness in machines, right? So that's a, a really big debate. And, and some, some people um, just took the default position that, look, if it quacks, if it walks, and if it does what a duck does, then you should treat it like one, right? Just to be on the safe side. And so if you can replicate that kind of stuff, then you, you should. Uh, and some of us are, are a little bit more well, cautious in that I'm not sure. I'm not sure when does an AI uh, become a full moral member of our community, right? I don't know if, if uh, that by the time my toaster is plugged into 5G, it can recognize my face, um, whether I should respect it more, for example, than my dog that cannot do that, uh, or my cat that you know doesn't even care about me. Um, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but imagine these ones actually not just my face, but also that I'm hungry and also that I want this and also that, uh, that I anticipate even the toast that they're going to give me. Imagine that it could do more cognitive things. I'm not really sure that that's enough for me to give it more rights than I give to, to the creature. Right now, of course, a lot of the animal, sorry, a, a lot of the AI rights are modeling uh, their, their conversation and the debates from uh, animal rights that we used to think that only animals were worthy of being moral uh, members. And then, sorry, that only humans. And then, of course, we were finding out that these cognitive processes happen at all kinds of levels with all kinds of different conditions, and then we included them. And so uh, what I want to say is that this is a very uh, complex debate, um, and, and there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of questions about whether we should even grant them rights to start with. Let's do uh, Beck and then Robert, and then let's do one more question after that. And then after that, we'll probably get transition into the open mic. Yeah. And I want to do give a couple of closing words for the people who just walked in. Yeah. Let's do Beck's question. Yeah, um, more of like an ethical question. Um, would one concern be that um, by automating a lot of decisions, um, especially with like really 
consequential decisions that you know can really like you know make or break someone's life. Yeah. Um, that kind of giving that to the machine is sort of a way of the human operator sort of absolving themselves of responsibility. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's just you did the numbers, though, that's just what the machine's that out. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, we can't do anything about it. But it's, yeah, it's, yeah. 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 That's a big worry, um, and, and, and the worry is that uh, even some engineers or some practitioners just kind of offload it, right, uh, the, the moral responsibility. And some of us are trying to push back and say, um, well, the decision, the moral decision, the moral agency actually happened even before you deployed the method. Um, you are still making trade-offs. You're still the one that's deciding whether to deploy this in this context, right? And so uh, a, a lot of people would say, like, this is math. This is computers. Math and computers are neutral. I just build the thing. I have nothing to do with, I'm not responsible for what happens. And some of us are trying to push back and say, you know, uh, just in the way you build the model, just in the thing, in, in the ways in which you build the weights that your model uses to then give you these results, you were already doing something ethical. And so you don't get to wash your hands and neither do I, right? And so um, that's, a, a, again, a big debate in, in ethics of, of AI and data ethics, who is responsible, when are you responsible? And one of the things that a lot of us are trying to push back is that this is not a non-moral setting. And that in fact, even before you choose which formal method, which math to use, you're already incurring in an ethical decision, right? And your values go into it and, and your interests go into it. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, that because for example, that happens a lot in this um, problem of AI fairness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think, it's like, look, how can we make my bias algorithm fair? Oh, there's, there's math for that. Right? There's actually lots of mathematical notions of fairness. And some people say like, oh, I'm just gonna use this formal notion and then my algorithm is gonna be uh, fair and that's it, right? I don't have to worry about it. Well, it turns out that a lot of these notions of fairness actually don't do what they're supposed to do or they're not compatible with one another. So you even have to choose between them to choose what you thought was fair, what you meant by fair, and then deploy the math to implement that notion of fairness. So again, guess what you were doing? You were doing ethics. And if you're doing it through denial, then you're failing at ethics, right? And so, uh, yeah, we, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's a genuine and big concern in the literature. Yeah. All right, let's do Robert's question then. Well, I found that the conversation academically ever was really dry out. Um, I was in testimony yesterday. She was a four year old. Yeah. Yeah. We have an addiction issue with it. Mm -hmm. And every time you pick up our smartphone, our primitive country gallows brain, you have no idea what's on the other side of that screen. There is an avatar for billions of people. They know exactly what we're doing, what our figures are doing, how long we yeah. spend gazing at whatever, and the purpose is to keep us on there so we buy it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. called addiction. Yeah. And it's plain and simple. And I think you're way ahead of academia as far as the ethics go in using AI. With our primitive under capital brain mm -hmm. as we go through social media or through the internet. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think uh, some of us are, are genuinely and uh, very, very interested in this. Uh, what what uh, this professor called surveillance capitalism logic, right? Uh, and, and the methods by which they achieve that, which is by exploiting our cognitive limitations uh, and our cognitive biases. So, so we're the kinds of uh, wired animals that can be triggered and can be guided by, by certain stimuli. And these applications and these technologies have members, uh, groups of 30 engineers, 30 psychologists, 30 social psychologists devising ways to trigger more of these responses. And so uh, for a lot of us, this is extremely worrisome in the context, of course, human agency, but even in the, in the context of democracy and in the context of being, at the end, an autonomous being. And, and so uh, uh, you, you hit it in the nail. This is one of the concerns of the data ethicist as well as the AI ethicist, because they, they go hand in hand, that um, these technologies and the way they're being built are far, very quickly surpassing our own ability to defend ourselves, but even 
our governments to defend us uh, uh, through regulation and in our other means. And so that's definitely a work that we have. Okay, so um, uh, I want to encourage you all to ask questions. And um, so what I'm going to do now at this point is just kind of open it up to a discussion and everyone can meet Dr. Alvarado and you can hang out for longer and we can ask questions. Right. But um, we're going to transition. I'm going to start setting up the stage for the open mic. I did put out the sign-up sheet. For some reason, I started the sign-up sheet at number 12, sort of begin with what we had last week. So I just want to see what number we get to. I think it'd be kind of neat if people show up for an open mic, like something a few months down the road, say, oh, I'm number 233. I don't know why I think that's neat, but I think that'd be neat. So anyways, the sign-up sheet is out for the open mic. But before we transition, I did want to say um, a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Alvaro, and I'll circle back to that in just a moment. But I do have goals for this discussion series. And one of the primary goals that I have is for this to evolve into a closer relationship between the university and the neighborhood. Um, I consider it sort of incumbent on myself as a the steward of the space to try to get people to ask questions that are spiritually and intellectually nourishing. And that I think is very important for our self-actualization as human beings. And that I think is really central to what I'd like the mission of Alluvium to be. So I do hope you'll keep attending these conferences. I hope we'll have more speakers out from the university. And we do have goals for this lecture series, which is that to make it very interactive like this. Um, and our other goal is actually to evolve this into a set of micro lectures that we can turn into a TED talk type series. So um, please keep attending these six o'clock deep discussions on Sundays. I know some people are here strictly for the open mic. So to those people, I wanna say thank you for letting us go over a little bit. We'll try not to do it too often. And then I also, while I'm setting up, I wanna encourage anyone in the room to please feel free to go up to Dr. Alvarado and ask him some questions about um, his field of expertise. Um, but before I close it out for that, I'd like us to all give a really warm round of applause for I think was a brilliant discussion by Dr. Alvarado. Thank you for being here and being our first discussion.